Okay, so let's get started. <clears throat> so starting from this lecture, we are going to talk about the phase from different perspectives. If you think about what we are doing so far, we are actually learning database as a user, right? We teach you how to use it. Today, we are going to open up the black box of database management system and try to understand how to build a very simple one and how to design a very simple database management system. So from a user perspective, what do we know, right? So we talk about our data model, right? In this course, we focus on data model. That is something we call relational model. All of your data are stored as a whole bunch of relations, right? So each relation uh, has a whole bunch of attributes and all the values within a single attribute is going to of the same type. And every single row corresponding to some association or some relationship among all those uh, kind of uh, values in those attributes. So you have the schema, right? The database is a set of relation. Each relation has name, right? has set of attributes. Each attribute has a name and has a type, right? So we have been looking at this example for a long, long time, right? So if you give me something like this, you are defining relation look like this. So, and then we talk about different ways you can actually query information stored in a relational database. We talk about those query languages on the theoretical side, right? And their relationships. So there's relational algebra, which is imperative query language that actually manipulate your relations as if they are sites or bags of information. And we have relational calculus, which is a declarative way for you to specify a query. <coughs> so instead of telling the database how to get the information you want, a relational calculus query will actually define the property you want in the result. And the goal of the database is really to take as input the query language that's in relational calculus and automatically find the expression in relational algebra to make it happen. Right? We talk about different subsets or the relationship, and then we go to the SQL side, right? We talk about different subset of SQL languages, some of them corresponding to relational algebra with only selection, projection, draw, and renaming. Some of them give you the full relational algebra, right? And we talk about some other functionalities goes beyond those relational query. If you think about what really happened under the cover, right? So we have a database, you as a user, um, when you, whenever you create a table, right? What's going to happen? The database is going to create a table for you on your hard drive, right? It's very important the data is on hard drive because uh, then even if you kind of put the plug of your machine and you restart it, you still want your information to be there, right? And whenever you're asking a query, what the database is trying to do is try to bring the information all the way from your hard drive to your memory and then to you as a user. Starting from this lecture, we are actually going to open up this process. We are actually trying to understand whenever you're asking a query to a database system, what is the thing that's happening underneath the cover to make this query uh, answering process happen? And that is the database system. We are going to spend the next maybe four or five lectures to really walk through the structure of a very, very simple database system. So in this lecture, we are going to give you First, a very high level view about how that works. And second, we are going to talk about essentially the bottom layer of the system, that is uh, the disk manager, okay? So <clears throat> modern database system is a very complex software artifact, right? So we need to scope ourselves a little bit to really simplify the thing we are going to focus on. If you talk about the real world data management system today, that could be really, really complex. So for example, this is actually, actually already a pretty old thing to talk about. So this is actually like one machine from Oracle, right? If you are thinking about, ah, oh, where is my database? Uh, what is the database system today, right? So it's actually a very complex uh, infrastructure, right? So like in this machine, I think there are five different computer servers, right? You have maybe 64 cores, right? You have half terabyte of memory, right? So all of them, will work together to store your information, right? And all those machines are connected with really fast network. Well, it, it, it's not that fast in today's standard, right? So, but I think this information from a couple of years ago, right? So they used to have 40 gigabits, like a network connecting them using InfiniBand, right? And then you have maybe 100 terabyte of uh, disk 
right? So and the whole bunch of SSD, right? For five terabyte of 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 SSD, like in this very beefy machine. And your data is actually going to be stored here, and right? your database is going to be hosted here. But now you're asking a query, database system to automatically deal with this very complex uh, hardware infrastructure. And that's not something we are going to go through in this course, right? So I mean, that's really the topic for a more advanced database system course. So we are going to talk about something much simpler than a real world database system. So our mentality model is as follows. We are going to talk about a relational database with a very, very traditional disk oriented architecture. Essentially, we have several assumptions First, all of our data are stored on disk. And second, we assume disk is much larger than the main memory. And then we are assuming reading from disk is much slower than reading from memory. And we are only going to talk about these three different players. We have your CPU, we have your DRAM, and we have your hard drive, and that's it. We were not going to talk about uh, like, like SSD, we are not talking about like even more advanced, so for example, NVMe, right? So we are not talking about distributed database. We are talking about a very simple uh, kind of hardware infrastructure. We have a single CPU. We have your DRAM directly connected to, like, to that, right? So, and then we have your hard drive. And then on the software side, right? If you like talk about the current like uh, architecture of a database system, yeah, as they see, it is also pretty complex, right? So on the left hand, uh, on the left hand side, you can see this is actually the uh, kind of architecture diagram of, of DB2 from IBM, right? On the right hand side, you can see this is a diagram for Oracle, right? So we are going to talk only a subset of those players, right? Uh, because we don't really have time to go through the whole thing. So here is our simplified model for like about how database works. Right. So in the bottom, right, all of your information is actually stored as a bunch of files. For example, you have two relations in the database system, right? So maybe one of the relations is stored in one file, another relation is stored in another file, right? So in the bottom, you have the information you are storing on your hard drive. In the top, you have your SQL query. The user gives the system a SQL query, and then yeah, sorry, my coffee machine. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so 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 in the top, so the user is going to give the system a SQL query, and then the system is going to return the result of that SQL query, which is one relation. So to do this, the database like they do this in a layer layer by layer way, right? So in the bottom, there is the disk manager to really try to manage all of your hard drives and manage all the operations you have related to your hard drive. And then above that, we have the buffer pool manager, right? Which really try to create a in-memory buffer such that everything above this layer does not need to worry about the fact that your information is, is stored on hard drive in, instead of stored in memory. And then above that, the database is going to implement a whole bunch of access method that's going to manipulate the information in the buffer pool. And then over that, you have a whole bunch of operators. Each one of them can correspond to some operators in relation to algebra. You, you can implement join, you can implement scan, right? So in this layer. Mm -hmm. And over that, there's a query optimizer that takes as input a SQL query, which is almost equivalent to a relational calculus query, and then automatically find the relational algebra expressions uh, that uh, is equivalent to this relational calculus query, right? So once you have that relational algebra uh, expression, right, it, it can be decomposed into a whole bunch of operators, right? Each operator can be executed using a whole bunch of access method, and each access method is going to fetch information from the buffer, right? So, and the buffer is going to talk to the disk manager to get the real page or real file from the hard drive. So this is actually what's going to happen. Right. Whenever you have a SQL query on the top, so essentially the information flow is the query uh, optimizer going to find a relation algebra expression. And then the operator execution part is going to run each of those operators in your expression, 
right? To run each operator, you need a whole bunch of access method, right? Each access method talk to the buffer and the, the buffer manager also talk to the disk manager to directly fetch information from the hard drive. So this is a very, very simple structure, right? Of a kind of disk oriented database system, like very traditional one. So in this course, we are going to go through each of those layers one by one. And we are going to go in the direction from the bottom to the top. So today we are going to talk about the disk manager. The uh, uh, next Wednesday, we are going to talk about the buffer. The Friday, we are going to talk, talk about access method. Then we are going to talk about crowd optimization. Yeah, so that is our plan for the next four or five lectures. So now let's talk a little bit about each layer in detail. Right. So what is the job of a disk manager? We have already been touching that, but let's make that a little bit more precise. So the job of a disk manager is really try to interact with your hard drives. For example, if you want to allocate a page on the hard drive, you should talk to the disk manager instead of doing that all by yourself. Right? Whenever you want to delete a page, you talk to your disk manager. Right? You want to fetch a page, that is the job of a disk manager. So the goal of the disk manager layer is to make sure all other layers above it do not interact with the hard drive directly. So whenever you want information from hard drive, you talk to the disk manager, okay? And then you go one layer up. Now you know how to talk to the hard drive. So the second layer is buffer pool management. <clears throat> Essentially, it's try to create an in-memory buffer such that all the other layers that are above it have the illusion that your data is in memory, not on disk, okay? So one thing that's very complex in the database system is your information is actually, some of them are in hard drive, some of them are in, in, in memory, right? So <clears throat> we want to have a unified view about your data. And that view is by providing something called a buffer, okay? Whenever uh, some other layer, for example, access method, want to access information, it always assume you are going to serve me from the buffer. It actually do not know whether the information is in hard drive or in memory or not. It is the job of the buffer pool manager to provide that kind of illusion that all the information are in the main memory, not on hard drive. So what, uh, what interface is it going to provide to the upper layer, right? So it's going to allow you to actually fetch a page, right? If the access method to say, okay, fetch page number two, right? The buffer pool manager is going to give you that page, okay? So if that page is on hard drive, it's going to fetch it for you. If that page is already in, in main memory, it's going to just return that to you. But you as access method have no idea where that page is. I mean, you will always assume, okay, that page is in the buffer, right? So maybe you fetch it, maybe it's already there, that's not my job to worry about. It's the buffer manager's job to worry about that. <clears throat> you can update the page, right? And you can actually, like, like whenever you do update, you are kind of assume, I, I, whenever I apply my update, so the buffer pool manager is going to actually push that page, right, to the hard drive, right, to really reflect my updates, right? I'm going to just ask the buffer pool manager to update the page. I'm not the only, uh, so I'm not the one to, really do the real kind of like, like update on the, on the hard drive, right? So that's the interface that the buffer pool manager provide to all the upper layers, right? And to implement each of one of this, the buffer pool manager is going to talk to the disk manager to really fetch a real page from the hard drive, right? And then one layer up, right? <clears throat> we have all those access methods, right? So they actually provide different ways for you to access data from a relation. So what do we mean by that? So you could provide some uh, functionality, for example, sequential scan, right? So I want to scan this relation tuple by tuple, right? So that could be one access method. And you could have some like B-tree index and then you just access the B-tree, that's also possible. You could have a hash table, right? You can actually do lookup on tuples in, like in a relation. So in this layer, the access method layer essentially provide a whole bunch of ways that you can access information from a relation. And then to do that, it's going to uh, have a sequence of calls to the buffer pool manager to really fetch different pages, which in turn is going to call uh, the disk manager to really get the real page, okay? So what that interface that this layer, the access method layer going to provide 
to the upper layer, right? So I'm essentially giving you a higher level abstraction to access information in your table without interacting with the buffer or disk. Essentially, every layer above it is just going to use all those access methods that are provided by this layer. They actually do not talk to the buffer. They do not talk to the disk manager. They only talk to the access method layer. And then one layer up, right? So this is actually where you implement a whole bunch of relational algebra expressions. So for example, you have join, you have projection, you have selection and so on and so forth, right? So each one of them is going to be implemented in this layer using the access method, right? For example, whenever you want to do projection, right? You need to scan the table, right? And then for each tuple, you just project to a certain column and you return that as an output, right? So here you are going to use the sequential scan like the access method and then make that happen, right? So whenever I'm implementing that, I will not talk to my buffer, I will not to I will not talk to my disk manager. I will only use a whole bunch of invocations to the access method provided by the access method layer. And uh, again, this layer, the, op op the operator execution layer is going to provide some interface to the upper layer, right? So it's going to provide essentially even higher level of abstraction to run a whole bunch of relational algebra uh, expressions, uh, sorry, like uh, like operators. So, and then we go one layer up, right? So this is a query optimizer, right? So this is actually giving a SQL query. It's actually corresponding to a relational calculus query, right? You generate a good execution plan, right? What is execution plan? It is actually a tree or DAG of relational algebra operators, right? Which is actually corresponding to a relational algebra expression. So given that, uh, it's actually going to invoke the operator execution engine, right, to actually run that relation algebra, uh, like, like run that, uh, like, so it's going to call the operator execution layer to actually run that relation algebra expression. Okay, so today we are going to talk about the disk manager, and in the next couple of lectures, we are going to go all the way from the bottom to the top. So before we talk about the disk manager, right? So let's uh, try to model the performance or try to model the system bottleneck, right? To make sure whenever we are reading about the system, we know which part we are really trying to optimize for. And that gave us the storage hierarchy, right? Which is actually inspired almost all the optimizations that we are going to talk about in the coming couple of lectures. So again, a real world database system can be really complex, right? So in this course, we actually focus on a disk oriented architecture, but let's try to make that even more precise about what, what, what do we mean by that? And uh, given that assumption, what are the system bottlenecks? So one fundamental system limitation that we are going to deal with for disk oriented architecture is there exists a hierarchical structure among different ways you can store your data. If you are doing those programming, right? So you do C++, you do Java, right? So as a programmer, if you have a piece of memory that is private, infinitely large, infinitely fast, right? So not expensive, right? So like persistent, it means I, like if you pull the plug and you kind of restart, it's, the information still be there, your life will be much, much easier, right? And when you build a database system with that, it's actually, I mean, it's actually not trivial uh, because today we do have something similar to that. It's actually not trivial, but it could make your life much, much easier. But in reality, you are actually dealing with the information stored in that different level in this storage hierarchy, right? So at the very, very top, you have your CPU register, and then you have different level of caches inside your CPU, and then you have your main memory, you have a hard drive, and this is a very old picture, so sometimes you have tape, right? So whenever you go from the top to the bottom, right, you are getting slower, slower, slower. For example, accessing the register is maybe like one or two cycles, right? So, and then like, uh, like uh, and then whenever you want to access information from the hard drive, right? So we are talking about essentially millisecond level, right? So, and then whenever you are dealing with memory, that's often orders of magnitude faster than accessing information 
from the hard drive. But on the other hand, you go all the way from the top to the bottom, the storage is also going to get larger and uh, less expensive, right? So here are some numbers just to keep in mind, right? So how fast it is to uh, actually do one L1 cache reference, right? So that's actually in the nanosecond level. And then you go all the way down the hierarchy, it's getting slower and slower, slower, right? So L2 cache is, like, is actually much slower than L1, right? So, and then whenever you have a memory reference, that you already like 100 nanoseconds, something like that, right? So, and whenever you are sending kind of some piece of information through the network, right? So then you are actually talk about uh, like, a, for example, 20,000 nanoseconds, something like this, right? And this crucially create, for example, one megabyte from memory, and you go to maybe like, like 250,000 nanoseconds. And you can see, right? So all the way through the hierarchy, there's orders make you difference about the speed that you have in access information, right? So whenever you are trying to read some information from the like from the hard drive, right? So you quickly go to millisecond level, right? So so on and so forth. So this is just some example numbers of actually a pretty old hierarchy, right? So like today the number will actually change, but the orders of magnitude is actually going to stay the same. So the access time is actually very different, right? So we can also think about that as how many cycles that we are talking about. For example, you have a like CPU, like some normal CPU, right? So like one nanosecond is maybe like, uh, like two or three cycles, right? So if you are talking about the access information from the memory, right? So latency is actually is like usually like at scale as for example, 50 to 100 cycles, right? Whenever you are actually like access information from the hard drive is actually extremely slow, right? It's millions of cycles into wait, right? So, and this is actually the thing we are going to, we are going to deal with. So if this is a system architecture, right? No, so, sorry, I mean, if this is a hardware, uh, if this is the assumption on the hardware, right? So if you want to build an efficient system, it's very easy to see uh, what we are trying to optimize for, right? Essentially, we try to optimize the system to keep the CPU busy, right? To make sure we can optimize the, 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 the data movement from hard drive to memory and also optimize the data movement from memory to CPU. Because here the hard drive is so much slower than the memory in terms of data access time, right? So at the end of the day, in this course, we are actually trying to optimize the data movement from the hard drive to memory such that the CPU could be busier, right? So essentially that's the game we are trying to play. So like again, right? So the, 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 the story hierarchy is something that keeps changing, right? So this is actually not the not a very new one. And this is actually something still pretty old, but kind of more up to date than what you saw in the previous slides. So here you have something, for example, it is very common today that you have another layer between the memory and your hard drive, right? So you can have some uh, you can have some SSD, right, which is actually much faster than hard drive in many cases, right. So for example, in this case, uh, your access to the to the flash could be maybe one or two million cycles, right. So much much faster than hard drive, but still still slower than the memory, right. So and this is actually one hierarchy that's actually pretty recent, right. So here you have your main memory. And then down the road, you have actually some persistent memory, right? Which is actually like something like NVMe, you can connect it maybe through PCIe or maybe in the future, that's directly connected to your machine, right? And then down the road, you have SSD, you have your hard drive, right? So, and then at the bottom, you have tape, right? So this is actually a more modern uh, story hierarchy. But as you can see, right, so there's still like, uh, like like the same characteristic of access time still exists, right? From the top to the bottom, it's getting more and more, uh, it's getting like, uh, like slower, right? But on the other hand, your storage gets faster and also less expensive, right? So the story hierarchy is something change really rapidly nowadays because uh, there are a whole bunch of new hardware, right, that can actually insert different layers into the hierarchy. 
So for different type of hierarchy, you will end up have different database design, right? And actually, if you look at the modern database research, one of the main driving force is the advancement of hardware. Whenever you have some new computation, uh, like computation device, for example, GPU or, or IOPGA, right? Whenever you have a new storage hierarchy, right? So you need to rethink about how to construct a database system. And that often give you like a whole bunch of interesting research topic uh, in modern database research. So in this course, again, we are going to focus on a very, very simple hierarchy. You have CPU, you have a DRAM, and you have your hard drive. And we assume your performance is actually dominated by data movement from your hard drive to your main memory. That is what we are going to deal with. Okay, so how does hard drive work, right? So let's, so, so I'm sure many of you guys already knows about this, but let's try to talk about it to make sure we are on the same page, okay? So essentially, uh, a hard drive is actually a whole bunch of, of this disk, right? Uh, and then they are going to rotate, right? In certain speed. And then on the other hand, essentially your information is stored on this disk. And then you partition this disk into a whole bunch of like sectors, right? So, and then you have your, your, your disk head, which is here, right? That can actually only read information at this like, uh, like position, right? And then your disk height can rotate, your, your, your disk can also rotate, right? So that allow you to actually access information in uh, any places, right? So on the, on the disk, right? So for example, this is actually probably a more realistic view about how hard drive works, right? So you have your disk, right? Your, your information is stored somewhere on the disk. And then this is your head. Whenever I'm trying to access information, right? So I rotate my disk, and then I also rotate my head, and then I read and write at that place, okay? So the assumption we have is one head uh, only read and write uh, like at any one time, right? And also whenever I'm reading something or writing something, uh, I'm going to read and write a block, like, uh, like which often contains, uh, for example, multiple of the sectors, okay? Which is, we assume it's fixed. Uh, so, so like, like, uh, like, let me assume is a fixed constant, right? So, in in this course. Okay. So, and given this, right? So we can have a simplified performance model uh, about hard drive, which is going to be kind of important. So you have your seek time and you have your your rotate time, right? So essentially, I say, okay, give me information there, read it. So the first step in the system is the disk need to rotate and the head need to rotate, okay? So, and then let's call this like the seek time and, and rotate time, let's call the TS and TR, right? So the seek time is actually you move the arm, the head to a position, right? So, and then the rotational delay, right? The, the rotation time is I wait the block to rotate under my head, okay? So I have this two time. And then whenever, uh, for example, I want to read like one megabyte, right? You also have the transfer time that is, when the disk and the head are in the right position, when you try to really transfer the information from the hard drive to my memory, you have the transfer time, right? So that's actually the time you are actually moving the data to and from the disk surface to my memory. So assuming I want to access, for example, D blocks of information, okay? And assuming all those information are just scattered on my hard drive, Right, so their position is actually random, right? We call this random access, right? So if you want to do the random access, right? So what is the time, right? Essentially for each access, because they are random, I don't know where they are, right? So for each one of them, I need to uh, pay one unit of seek time, I need to pay one unit of rotation time, and then I need to pay one unit of transfer time, right? So that's actually what happened like uh, in random access. And then you could do sequential access, right? In the sense that all those D piece of information are sequentially stored on your, on your disk, right? So in this case, I only need to seek and rotate once, right? And then I can keep transfer data from my hard drive to my main memory, right? So as you can see, how your data is actually stored on your hard drive, their locality have a huge impact on the performance, right? Because whenever you seek and rotate, that's a physical process. 
right? So usually the second rotate time uh, is at the scale of kind of millisecond, right? So 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, so on and so forth, right? And your transfer time is often pretty, pretty fast, right? So it's kind of, if you want to read a kind of eight kilobyte uh, kind of block and the transfer time on a very slow disk, I mean, might only need like 0 0.1 millisecond, right? So as you can see, right? So on a hard drive, one property is that you are really dominated by the seek and rotate time. If, you, if your information just scattered around on the disk, that every single time I, I access a piece of information, I need to wait for the seek and rotate, that's going to be very, very slow. And that's the performance for the random access part. And whenever you have all the information stored sequentially on your hard drive, right? So you only need to seek and rotate once, and then you is much, much faster because you are going to be dominated by the transfer time instead of the seek and the rotate time. So let's just get some feeling about this, okay? So this is actually, uh, on YouTube, you can see a whole bunch of this. They actually try to test your hard drive, okay? So essentially, this is actually three different uh, kind of storage. So on this side, you have your hard drive, right? So which is actually a pretty new one. And then up here, you have your SSD, right? So the third one is actually a RAM disk. And you can actually mount a piece of your memory uh, as like, uh, like with the same essential IO interface. Like, I mean, look like a hard drive, but your information is actually like, uh, like in part of your memory, you can have a RAM disk, right? So, and then you can have different access patterns. You can have sequential scan, right? You can have a random access uh, where every single random access is uh, half a megabyte, right? Uh, you can have your uh, random access, your every single random access uh, is, for example, four kilobyte, right? And you can see how much uh, is a throughput I can get for each of these access patterns and for each of this uh, kind of storage. So, for example, if you are thinking, um, let's look at the number when they have it. Yeah. So, oh, sorry. Here. Yeah, so like we say, we look at the hard drive, right? Whenever I'm doing sequential scan, I'm getting like roughly 170 megabytes per second, right? From that hard drive, which is not that fast, but also not that slow, right? So you are pretty much bounded uh, by the connection from the hard drive to your main memory. However, whenever you are doing those kind of random access, if you think about, you have a whole bunch of random access, right? So you are reading different places and every single time I read it, right? Uh, I, I read a four kilobyte block, right? If you are doing this, <clears throat> the throughput you are getting from the hard drive is very, very small, right? So here you are talking about maybe one megabyte per second if all of your access are just random, uh, are just like all those like small random access, right? So, and you can see there's something in the middle, right? If you have a whole bunch of random access, but every single time you access it, you are reading a larger block, right? So instead of a four kilobyte, you are reading, for example, 500 kilobyte. And you can see the throughput you are getting from this piece of hardware, right? So it's actually uh, like, like much, much faster, right? You are talking about maybe I cannot get the full bandwidth, right? But I can actually get, for example, 100 megabyte per second, like for example, right? So, and you can see if you read like these three numbers, right? So you can actually see <coughs> kind of, they actually reflect our previous performance model. Right, so the larger the block is, right? So you are actually less dominated by the seek and rotate time. If your block is very, very small, like here, right? So you are actually going to be dominated by seek and rotate, which is going to be very, very slow, okay? So whenever we are dealing with a system design, this is actually the fundamental characteristic that we need to deal with about our hardware, okay? Because of this characteristic, our system look like what they look like in this course, okay? So, and again, if you have different type of storage, for example, if you move to SSD, right? And you can see it have a very different characteristics, right? So now the random access is still slow, but not that slow anymore, right? So the ratio between this actually start to change and then you will end up with different design on the system side. Actually, there's a lot of research, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, I'm still like uh, pretty active about how to build database when all your information are stored on SSD instead of on those hard drives, right? And whenever your information is in your in your in your DRAM, 
I mean, you can see the completely different kind of characteristics about the random access, about sequential scan, right? So and about different ratios, right? So, and like, again, like, a, like for different assumptions you are having on the relative ratio between sequential scan and random access, you will have a very different database system at the end. In this course, we focus on the first one. This is actually the numbers that we need to have in mind. Whenever I'm sequentially scanning my data, it's very fast, okay? I mean, not that fast, it's like reasonably fast, like, like 200 megabytes per second, and that's a number. Whenever I do a whole bunch of small random access on small block, that's extremely slow. It's like three or four orders of magnitude slower in terms of throughput I can get, uh, like compared with sequential scan, okay? Whenever I'm reading some reasonably large block, I'm actually in the middle. Okay, so that's the correct theoretic that we are going to have, which actually reflect our performance model. Okay. Yeah. So again, just to recap, we focus on very simple hierarchy. There's hard drive, DRAM, and CPU. Right. So DRAM to CPU is dominantly fast in this setting compared with hard drive to DRAM. That is, whenever we are analyzing performance of the design, we kind of, we have the luxury to only worry about data movement from hard drive to DRAM. Okay, we are not going to talk about cache locality in this, like in this course. Okay, we are trying to optimize the IO movement from hard drive to DRAM. So in modern data systems, uh, like often the whole thing is more complex than that, but as you can see, the data movement will often still be the bottleneck. It, it might not be the bottleneck caused by the hard drive, but it might not, it, it might be the bottleneck caused by, for example, when you are talking about the in-memory database, all your information is stored in DRAM, right? Then you are actually bounded by the data movement from the memory to your to your L3 cache, right? Uh, and then when now you are talking about a distributed database system where your information is stored, for example, on some other machine, right? Then your interconnection, your network, right, is going to become the bottleneck. And there the key is still data movement, right? So although the thing we are talking about in this course is a pretty simplified model, right? So the way of thinking about how to build a database management system to optimize for data movement will still apply for a different, more modern hardware architecture, okay? Okay, so this is the assumption we have on our hardware. And uh, I think we are on the same page about the game that we are going to play to make this system faster. We care about IO. Now let's talk about the bottom layer of a database system. And that is our disk manager. So it is the lowest layer of a really, a, you know, really traditional view of what the database is. So, and all the higher layer is going to call this layer to allocate or deallocate a page to really read and write a page, right? And also what's important is if the upper layer tell the disk manager, okay, so allocate uh, like 100 pages for me and I want them to be stored in a sequential way. It is disk manager's job to make sure they are really stored in a sequential way, okay? So that is actually very important, right? So that is actually disk manager's job to actually manage the locality of different pages, right? Such that everything above it, all the, uh, all the higher layers can just tell the disk manager how that layer wants the data to be stored, okay? It's also deal with kind of free space, it's also going to deal with locality, okay? So <clears throat> one assumption that we have, uh, actually it's not the, a crazy assumption is database management system often store database as uh, one or more files on disk, right? Some databases is going to use a single file. For example, if you talk about like SQLite, right? It's going to store your whole database uh, as a single file on your hard drive. Some databases are going to use uh, a collection of files. For example, if you look at PostgreSQL, right? So it's going to store your database as a whole bunch of files on your, on your hard drive. And today, many of the database system, they are going to use a file system provided by the operating system. But once upon a time, uh, there was a time 
uh, the database people actually try to build file system just specifically for database, right? So that may be 20 or 30 years ago, right? So that's a really uh, intense uh, research topic, right? About what is the best file system for database, right? So today, right? So we are actually going to be in the middle, right? So there are a whole bunch of uh, like optimizations that, that, data, that database people do uh, on the file system, right? But largely there are actually a lot of database system just, just relies on the file system provided by the operating system. So I think for PostgreSQL or for SQLite, right? So that's what happened. But if you talk about some other type of database, for example, um, some commercial one, right? So some of them have a whole bunch of optimizations, right? So integrated into the operating system, such that the file system is more friendly to your database. So, and the disk manager or the storage manager is responsible for maintaining all those files. So they organize files as a collection of pages and uh, each page is a fixed size block of data, right? You can store, for example, all the tuples in your relation uh, in like, like, like in a page, you can store a whole bunch of metadata whenever you have indexes like in your database. All those information are going to be stored as a collection of files and each file contains a collection of pages. And each page has a unique identifier and we are going to call it page ID, right? So now let's look at one example. Actually, let's take a break. Uh, I think the example, the, the demo is going to take longer than three minutes. Okay, so let's take a break. Uh, we are going to be back at 9.15, right? So then we will continue, right? So in the meantime, if you have any questions, uh, just let me know. I'll be here. I'll, <coughs> I'll be here to answer them. Yeah. Hello. I wanted to ask a question about the storage manager. Hi. Hello. Yeah. Okay. So um, on the slides, you said that the file storage typically is provided by the um, operating system. Yeah. And I can't remember correctly from the hardware course we had last year, but I was wondering if the storage manager isn't also provided by the operating system or managed by the operating system. Uh, in, uh, at least for PostgreSQL, no, right? So it actually has its own like this manager and uh, uh, and buffer manager. Okay, so like the database has full access or full control over the whole storage and um, memory, uh, no disk. Um, yeah, I mean, it's going to assume that, uh, so, so the database is able to allocate the pages or open files, right? So on your, on your hard drive and the database is going to like manage that. Yeah, but, but, but to create a page or to allocate a file, that part is in the operating system, at least for PostgreSQL. Yeah. Oh yeah, I understand. That's where my confusion came from. Yeah, yeah. and also yeah. the buffer manager, the database also have a buffer manager to really deal with the buffer. So what's interesting is the file system also have cache, right? So essentially what's going to happen is you are going to have one buffer managed by the database and you can have the file cache managed by the OS, right? So, and then that's actually become very interesting. So recently there's a research topic called the database and operating system co-design, right? To really get rid of those two different caches, right? So, but for PostgreSQL, I think in the standard mode, you are going to have two of those caches. One is a file cache provided by the OS. Another is a buffer provided by the database. That makes sense? Ah, uh, yeah, that makes sense. Really? Yeah, really, I mean, um, yeah, did, I'm you, gonna... did you already cover the buffer? Did I miss it? Maybe or is it? Oh, buffer, buffer is the common one state. Yeah. So okay. we are going to talk about this measure today, and then we are going to move on and talk about the buffer. Yeah. Um, I was wondering where's the buffer stored, if it's not using the hardware um, the file system uses. Is it? Oh, yeah. I mean, buffer is just like one chunk of memory that uh, PostgreSQL manages. Ah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, and I see one comment in the chat window. Yes, tape still use a lot. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, so let's get started. So we were talking about so how database really organize uh, a relation as whole bunch of files, right? So each file is a collection of pages, right? So and a page is a essential fixed size block of data, right? And each page has a unique identifier. So all of this might look a little bit abstract, but we can actually look at one examples about what would happen in a real world data systems. So we are not going to use PostgreSQL, right? So because it's, it's too complex for this purpose, uh, we are going to talk about SQLite, okay? So essentially, I'm in an empty directory. So if you do SQLite, and uh, let's create a database, for example, called DB, okay? You go this, right? So you can actually, uh, you can see, I'm, I'm, I'm now here. So I can actually, for example, create a table named A with two columns, maybe one attribute here, another attribute here. Okay. And then I can uh, see, right? So on the file system, right? You can see there's already a file called DB. So this is actually what's going to happen, right? So the database is going to actually store all the information essentially within this file, okay? So I can actually insert some tuples, let's insert some tuples. Um, for example, I insert two tuples, A, B, and C, D, into this relation, if you select from it, you can see, ah, there are actually two tables. So what happened, right? Um, like, like, uh, like in a file system, it's as follows. Like we can just open this file and see what happened, okay? So as you can see, it's in binary format, but uh, we can actually do this. This is actually a file managed by the database, okay? Whenever you actually create a database here, right, they're really going to create this file. Whenever you are inserting information, creating tables, all of this are being reflected in this file, okay? If you want, you can actually read this file. It's actually not that hard to read, right? So actually, uh, if you go to SQLite, you can actually see there's actually like a format like of this file, right? So at the very beginning, right, we can actually read that together a little bit, right? So the, the offset equals zero, essentially we are at here. This is offset equals zero, right? The first 16, right? So essentially you have the header string, SQLite format three, as you can see, this is actually like that string, right? Corresponding to SQLite format, right? Just like this. And then at 16, which is here actually, uh, you have essentially your page size. This is actually how large the page is. Now you can see here is actually like a 1000, right? So this is actually the page size. The same database is going to uh, organize this file into a chunk of those pages and every single page is of the size as this, okay? So, and then we can actually try to find that page. If you go down this file, right? As you can see, starting from here, one zero zero zero, right? This is actually the start of a page. It's the start of the first page. And you can actually go all the way down to the bottom. You can see you end at the 2000, right? Here, this is actually one page, like, like before here to like all the way up to here, right? So this is actually one page, right? So it's actually part of the file with fixed length, right? So, and uh, how large the page is, is actually defined by the database, right? So here, uh, you define the page size like 1,000, right? So, so you have this. I mean, you have this page from 1,000 to 2,000, right? So uh, you can actually try to read each page. And you can see, right? So starting from here, the page contains a lot of zero, right? But there are a whole bunch of non-zero information. The first one is at the start of the page, the beginning of the page, right? So, and you can actually read the kind of standard, right? So at the very beginning, this is the first bit of information, right? So I can, you can see what, what do you mean by zero D, right? So like zero D means that this is a page, which is a kind of leaf table, B3 page, whatever. This is a type of the page. You have a whole bunch of meta information about the page. And all the other information, like for example, like these two tuples that we stored, like, like we just inserted into the relation, is also stored in this page. 
And your database is going to store information uh, like from the end of the page to the beginning of the page, okay? So as you can see, right? So we inserted two tuples, right? One is AB, another is CD. Right? You can actually see that here, right? So like 61, 62 is the ASCII of A and B, right? So, and also 63 and the 64, I think, is ASCII of C and D, right? You can, all, you can actually see all the information we are actually storing is actually in this page, right? So there's actually no magic, right? So essentially, if you look at structure of the page, it's a fixed chunk of block of data. And then at the beginning of the page, you have a whole bunch of meta information, right? About what's, what, what's in this page, so on and so forth, with the type of page, right? And uh, the real data is actually stored from the end of the page to the head of the page, okay? So just to convince you this really what happened, uh, by the way, do not do this for, for like uh, for for real database. Uh, and we can actually change the information in this page and we can see that it gets reflected in the database. So let's put this in a, as a random character, like 70, right? Um, and then let's reflect it. So I actually change something here. I actually change something in the, in the page. As you can see, uh, it's now should be a P, right? I changed 61 to 70. And then if you redo the query inside your database, we are here on the left-hand side. Um, maybe let's re reload it. Yeah, and you can see if I kind of like read information from A, and you can see, right, so now like this tuple, like this value is changed from A to P, right? So really there's no magic, right? So database essentially are going to organize your relation as essentially a whole bunch of files in the context of SQLite, that is a single file. The whole database is a single file. And each file corresponding to a, a collection of pages, right? How large each page is, is a parameter you can define in your database, right? So here at the very beginning of the database, you have 1000 here, that's why uh, the page size is 1000, right? So because of that, your first page going to start from 1000 and going to end uh, before 2000, right? So, I mean, you can actually, if you change that value, right? So you are going to have a file, uh, like, like you are going to have database with larger or smaller page size, right? And then within a page, right? So you have those meta information at the beginning, and then you have your data starting from the end. Okay, so that's actually what happened. And uh, all those things actually have a almost one to one, they have one to one correspondence to the real information that you can get from the database. Okay, so this is just one quick illustration about uh, essentially all those concepts the file, the page, right? And uh, to convince you, there's really nothing else going on, right? So and there's only one file in my, in my file system, right? So, okay. So the, the job of storage manager is really try to manage that file okay, that we just saw like in SQLite. Right? So try to manage all those pages and try to organize those pages and try to map every single tuple you have in your relation into a sequence of bits inside the page. So that is the job of storage manager. So it stores relation as a collection of pages and each page uh, it's going to store a collection of tuples, right? So there are two questions that uh, we want to understand. The first one is how does the database management system manage a collection of pages? And second, how does the database management system store tuples on each page, okay? So for the rest of the lecture, we are trying to understand these two questions. Okay, so we are going to walk through this kind of uh, layer by layer, right? So at the beginning, we have the relation you want to store, and then it's going to become a file, and file is a collection of pages, and you need to organize all those pages in some way, and we are gonna talk about it. And then each page, it has its own layout, right? Which allows it to store a whole bunch of tuples, and each tuple also have its layout, right? We are going to go all the way from file to page to tuple. So that is what we are trying to do for the rest of this lecture. That's the structure, okay? Okay, so what is a file? So there are different ways you can actually store a file, uh, but one really common way to do it is by using something called a heap file. Okay, okay so heap file is an, an ordered collection of pages 
where tuples are stored in a random order. So it's actually support a whole bunch of operations uh, at the record level. Okay, so and it's actually need to keep track of a page in your file and keep track of free space uh, on pages, or keep track of the record uh, like on a page. So that might look a little bit abstract, but this is actually uh, the definition of keep file in a very simple database system called MiniDB developed by Wisconsin. And you can see like what are the interface that the heap file really provide to you, okay? So essentially uh, you can actually get how many record you have right in the file. This is the return number of record in the file, right? And you can actually insert the record, right? So, and the, here that like, you are giving me the content of the record and then you get back the record ID, right? And what is record ID? Record ID is actually a pair of page ID and also uh, kind of the ID of the, the tuple within the page. And you can delete the record, you can update the record, you can get the record, right? So, and each record corresponds to a tuple, right? Like, like in the relation, right? You can actually scan this file. You can also delete this file, right? So this is actually the interface that a heap file is going to provide for you. So there are multiple ways to implement this, right? So if, you, if I want to have a file providing all these interfaces, there are multiple ways to do it. You can store it, like you can implement it as a, a linked list of pages, or you can store it using something called the page directory. And we are going to go through them one by one. One way to implement this abstraction is really try to say, okay, so a file is a collection of pages. I will have two linked list of pages. I have all those pages that's free as one linked list. And I have all those pages that contains data, or those records or tuples as another linked list. Okay. So, and then I will put all the free page together. I will put all those uh, like page with data together. And whenever you ask me to insert a record, so what do I do, right? So then I will go to like essentially uh, like, uh, like, like all the data page to see whether there are empty slot, right? So I will try page number one. I will see, ah, I mean, there's no empty slot here. I go to page number two, there's no empty slot. Number three, if there's empty slot, I insert that tuple into page three. Otherwise, I will go to the free page. I will take one free page, bring them to this, to this linked list and insert tuple in the free page. And then they're not free anymore, right? So I'm going to remove that from the linked list, right? Uh, like from the free linked list and put them here, right? So, and then I maintain these two linked list. So this could be one way for you to actually implement the heap file, right? So another way is to, <coughs> is to use something called a page directory, right? So that is, I do not maintain a linked list between all the pages. Instead, I'm going to have a whole bunch of a header page that contains a whole bunch of slots, right? And that's actually mapped to each page, right? So within this slot, I'm going to keep track essentially how many tuples I already inserted in this page, right? Whenever you want to insert a tuple, I can go through the page directory to say, ah, page one is full, page two have one slot. I go to page two, insert a tuple, then I'm done, right? So this is another very natural way to implement all those functions like, uh, like in HIPAA. So what are the trade off here, right? Whenever we are talking about system design, right? So we essentially try to read it about pros and cons of different ways of implementing the same interface, right? So the pros and cons are as follows. If you do a very naive implementation using linked list, there will be a whole bunch of free space on the data page, essentially here and there, right? Because whenever you are inserting like information, right? So because I'm doing the linked page, I'm pretty greedy, right? So I will find some slot and then I, then I insert it, right? So I do not have a global view on my information, right? For example, if page three is almost empty, right? I, I, I could merge per, like, like page two and page three, right? So but I don't have that information in a naive implementation using linked list, right? Of course, you can always go crazy and, uh, and, and implement a whole bunch of things to make 
that better, right? But in a naive instrantation, that's a little bit hard to do. So on the other hand, because in the page directory implementation, you have a global view on the data allocation on the distribution of data to different pages, right? In principle, you could do some optimizations to make sure uh, like all the pages are actually almost full, right? You do not have information scattered around. So what are the performance here, right? So, I mean, here, I mean, essentially given different assumptions, we can reason about uh, essentially the performance. So assume that uh, we have the link and list uh, implementation, assume that the header page fit in memory and all the other pages, are, for example, uh, randomly allocated on disk. I mean, I mean, they could be a screenshot, but like, like for this case, let's assume they are randomly allocated on disk and assume we have these pages. Whenever I want to insert a tuple, right, into this file, so what are the performance, right? So because everything is random, right? So I actually need to uh, kind of like uh, like sequentially go through like each page, right? So uh, for page one, so what is the performance? I need to pay one unit of time that corresponds to seek and rotate. Why? Because I have one random access on the hard drive, right? So this is where the TS plus R comes in, right? And then I have to read this page from the hard drive to memory. So I pay one transfer time. And then I will check whether there are empty slots there or not. If there is an empty slot, I'm going to insert the data there. And then I will flash the data back to my hard drive. So essentially I pay one unit of sequence rotate for page one. And then I will read and write. So I pay two units of transfer time for a single page. Right, so that is assume if page one has that slot. Otherwise, I'm going to go to page two. So I'm going to pay two times of the whole thing. Right, I'm keep doing this until I find a page with empty slot. So uh, what is the performance of finding a record? Right, so here essentially we also find a record by some non RID value. Right, for example, like I have say, oh, I give me a person with age equals to five, something like this. So here you kind of need to go through uh, every single tuple stored in all the pages and try to find those tuples that correspond to uh, and that satisfy your condition, right? So here <clears throat> in expectation, assuming that tuple is stored randomly, right? So in expectation, right, I probably need to go through uh, like, uh, like D over two number of pages until I find it, right? And then because all the pages are kind of randomly allocated on hard drive for each of the page, I need to pay one unit of time of seek and rotate. And then I need to pay one unit of time for reading the data from the hard drive to my main memory, right? So that's why we have this expression here, right? Under our assumption, that is the performance. If you change your assumption, for example, you say, ah, all the data pages are actually not randomly allocated, that's crucial allocated, then you have different performance, okay? So <clears throat> what is the performance for scan all the tuples in this uh, file, right? So here I have to go through all the data pages. If you have D of those for every single one of them, because we assume they are randomly allocated on disk. In the worst case, you pay one unit of C can rotate, you pay one unit of transfer. So we can reason about this for different type of models, right? For example, assuming I'm doing this uh, page directory type of implementation, I assume the whole directory, all the header pages fit in memory. Uh, I assume pages are sequentially allocated on disk, okay? Which might not be the case, right? So when you can, if you change your assumption, you will have different performance model. But for this purpose, let's assume they're all sequentially allocated on disk. So I want to insert a tuple. Right, so like, uh, what is the performance? Right, so in this case, I'm going to go through the page directory. I'm going to find the page with an empty slot. Right, so in this case, uh, because all the header page fit in memory, right, I don't really have any data movement from disk to memory. Right, I'm going to find the page with an empty slot, and then I'm going to go to that page. I will fetch it from the hard drive, update it, insert a tuple, and write it back. Right, so I need to pay one second rotate 
and then two units of like, like for read and write. Okay. So when you're building a real system, like read and write also will have different performance, but you can always make this cost model or performance model like uh, a little bit more complex to model that. Right? This is a very simple one. Okay. So like how to find the record. Right. So in this case, it's very similar to yeah. So go ahead, go ahead. <coughs> so any questions? I have a question. So yeah. for the inserts, the seek and uh, rotate, yeah. um, is it to like find the free page or is it to like go to the free page? Oh yeah, for this one, it's like, okay. So, 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 so seek and rotate is actually to go to that free page, right? Okay. So essentially, so, so, so like think about what you like, what you need to do. So, so I know page three has empty slot. So you need to read the information, like you need to read page three from hard drive to memory, right? So mm -hmm. you are going to pay one unit of seek and rotate because you don't know where your, your disk head is, right? You will pay one unit of seek and rotate. And then I bring that data uh, to memory. I update it and I write it back, right? Okay. So seek and rotate is, is the time you need to find that page, right? Like, like, like even though you know where it is, you still need to rotate the disk. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Makes sense. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> okay. So, and what's the performance of finding a record, right? So, if you are trying to find a record by some non RID value, right? So, you are not trying to say, ah, give me a tuple with RID equals to this. You are trying to find some by some non RID value that the only way you can do it is to scan all the tuple and find it, right? So it's the same as in previous case, right? But here, because all the pages are sequentially uh, allocated, right? You pay one unit of seek and uh, rotate, and then you keep reading those pages one by one, right? In expectation, and if you need to read uh, D over two number of pages to, to find that tuple, right? So you have this performance model in expectation under that assumption. So uh, how, like, like what's the time you need to pay to really sequential scan all the information here, right? You pay one unit of time for seek and rotate to find the first page. And because all the pages are sequentially uh, allocated on hard drive, right? So you keep reading it, right? So like, like then, then, then you pay the unit of transfer time, right? For reading it. So this is a performance model, right? Given different assumptions, given different implementations, you can actually reason about the performance. So this will become very interesting down the road. We will have, for example, different ways to implement some relational algebra expressions. This is the, the exercise that we are going to do together. And that's actually what data is going to use this performance model or cost model to automatically pick for you the best execution strategy, right? So this is a very simple example about how to reason about IO data movement. And down the road, that can become a little bit more complex when you have multiple layers right, in the system. So <clears throat> now we understand how does database organize a file as a collection of pages and how to manage those pages. We can actually go uh, one layer down to really understand how that database manage the layout of page, right? So how does it manage information there? So as we see from this example in, in SQLite, right? So one page, is one chunk of information, like a fixed size block of data. And then you have the header, which starts from the beginning, right, of the page. And then you have the data, which is at the end of the page, right? So essentially, for each page in the database, you have the header, contains a whole bunch of information, and then you have the data. So usually, the header will start from the beginning, and the data will start from the end, OK? So what type of metadata would you have, right? So you could have the page size, you could have the version of the database management system, you could have uh, some compression information, value data is compressed or not. You can have say, ah, oh, maybe the data is encrypted, right? So all those meta information, you could have the checksum, right? To avoid a bad person like me, change data directly, right? So you have all those metadata in the header. Uh, it's different in different database systems, right? But, but you get it, right? So the header contains all those meta information, Right, and then data is going to be stored from end to the beginning. So this is just one example interface <clears throat> for a page, right? So essentially, well, what are we talking about? 
for each page, this is the interface that I, that I provide. So I can uh, get the page ID for the next page. I can get the page, page ID for the previous page, right? If you are doing this in the LinkedIn list type of way, right? Each page has the next page, has the previous page, right? So I need to give you this. Uh, and all of this can be stored in the, in, the, in, the, in the header, right? So it's kind of easier for you to do. You can actually set the next page, set the previous page. Again, you can update the header. Uh, you can get my current page ID, right? So which can be stored in the header, right? So you can actually insert a tuple into this page. You can delete a tuple into this page. You can find the first record in this page. You can find the next record, right? You can get record, you can return record, so on and so forth. And you can tell the system how many available space you have on this page, which is pretty natural, right? Like pretty natural interface. So how does database make it happen, right? So there are multiple ways that you can implement a page. So naive strategy would be like this. I have a page, which is a fixed size block of data. I have my header, then I partition it into a whole bunch of slots, okay? And for each slot, is kind of fixed lengths, for example, like one kilobyte, uh, one kilobyte too large, for example, like 100 bytes, right? So and that's actually one slot, a whole bunch of those slots. And then in the header, I keep track how many tuples I am storing like in this page. Uh, and then for example, if someone say, okay, in this page, insert tuple one, right? So I can just go find the free slot, insert tuple one. If you want to insert tuple two, I will just scrunchly scan this. I will check whether slot one is full or empty. In this case, it's full. So I go to slot two, right, to insert it. Someone want to insert another one, I insert another one. If you want to delete T2, right, so I'm going to go through it, find T2, and delete it. Now I have an empty slot, right? So, and then I insert another T4, and then go through that from the beginning. I find, okay, slot two is empty, I insert T4 there, right, so on and so forth. So this could be one potential implementation for the interface we saw in the previous uh, slide. What's the problem here? <clears throat> the problem is that it cannot really support the case where tuples are of different length. For example, in your relation, if you have one attribute which of string type, right? So then every single tuple might have different size, right? Some of them are shorter, some of them are longer, right? So in this case, if you are doing this fixed length type of slot, you are going to end up have, I mean, essentially a lot of empty information and you can do padding to make sure all the uh, records are the same long, but then you are going to waste a whole bunch of spaces. So one of the most popular way that people are doing to really implement a page, right, the layout is something called slotted page. So it's actually work like this. You have your header at the beginning of the page contains all the meta information. And then in the data part, <coughs> you also filter decompose it. You have a whole bunch of uh, slots, okay? And every single slot corresponding to essentially one tuple that you can store on this page. And then every single slot is going to have a pointer point to the beginning of the record. And also is going to store information about the size of the record, okay? So whenever, for example, I want to insert a new tuple, right? So I can actually uh, fill in this slot. I say, okay, now I insert a new tuple, it's here. The beginning is here. And then I follow the pointer, I fill in the record, and that's it. If I want to insert another tuple, right? So I can actually filter, fill in like, like, like all the slot and also the data part like this. I, I can keep doing this. So here, <clears throat> each record, uh, the record ID is, represented as a page ID, you need to know where it is, right? Uh, and second, the slot ID, okay? So this can, can be just one way to implement the, the, the interface for a page, right? And each slot contains a pointer to the start position of each record and also contains the size of the record. The good thing about this is you can actually move data around without changing the record ID. Right. For example, for some reason, uh, if, if I want to move the, the, this orange record from here to, to here, right? So in this case, you just need to change the pointer. You do not need to change the record ID, right? Which often make the, the whole thing a little bit easier when you really kind of try to update your data. 
And then given this, right? So uh, a ne the next question we need to understand is how should you store the tuple, right? So what is the layout for a tuple, right, for a record? So there, again, there are so many different ways that you can actually store it. There's so many optimization you can do. But the most generic way of doing this is by uh, decouple it into two parts. You have the fixed length field at the beginning, and then you have the variable length field at the end. And then you have some uh, bitmap to really uh, identify whether that, uh, that attribute is null or not. Okay, because you could have null value here. So, and the fixed length field, right? For example, you have number, you have date, you have a string of fixed length, right? So you can actually put them directly into the fixed length part, right? And you can just do direct, uh, direct access because you know where it is, and you know where to find it. For those variable length field, right? It, it could be some string with variable length, right? So you can actually store them <clears throat> as, essentially very similar to slot the page, but you actually store them uh, at the tuple level. Right, you store a whole bunch of pointer to point to a specific location here to make sure you can actually find it whenever you need it. You don't need to screen or scan the whole thing to find it, right? Uh, and then, uh, yeah, and then that's it, right? So whenever you want to ac like access certain attribute, you first find the slot and you find the pointer, you follow the pointer, you get the information, right? It's kind of very natural. So how should we store null values, right? So that's actually the beginning in the bitmap, right? So every single attribute, corresponding to a single bit, right? Uh, it is one uh, if the field is null or, or the other way wrong, right? So, I mean, you just need to store one bit of information per attribute, but you can just put that in the bitmap at the beginning. So this is just one concrete example. If you want to store all those fixed length field, right? So like all those like field type can be stored in a file, in the header, in the system catalog, right? But you can actually know the first field is of this side, second field is of this side, right? So, and then whenever you need to access a field, you can actually just calculate the offset, you know the base address, you calculate the offset, you know where to find it and read it, right? So, and whenever you are dealing with those like a variable length field, I and mean, there are multiple ways for to do it, right? So you could say, ah, so I store how many variable length field I have, here I have four, I store the information, I have a spatial uh, symbol to identify, uh, to say, okay, this is the end of that field. Then I store the second field at the end, store the third one, so on and so forth. Or I could have a whole bunch of slots. I say, okay, so this is the slot for the first field, second, third, fourth, fifth, something like that. And then I store a whole bunch of pointers, right? And you'll say, okay, give me the third variable length field. Right? I'm going to the third field, follow the pointer, then know where to find it, right? So it's very natural. There are so many different ways you can do. Uh, the like usually in database, uh, the second way is kind of more like more generic. You will probably see that in more database systems, but they are database systems using the first one, right? So now let's look at one example in PostgreSQL. We are not going to open up the page structure, um, but we can actually like really try to understand a little bit better and look at an example. Um, yeah, we just need to have some database. I'm trying to install it. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, just one minute. It'll be very fast. Okay. Now I have a database running in PostgreSQL. So let's try to do something very simple. Let's just create a table uh, with values, whatever. I don't really care. Um, this. And let's insert two tuples. Uh, actually, three. Uh, let's say you have the first one is 0, 1. The second one, let's say 10, 11. The third one, 100. And this, so I'll go this and you'll say, yeah, I have three tuples. So what's that interesting, right? So you can actually uh, first one get which file that the database is storing this at. You can select, I forget the name of the function. You can 
do this. Let's try. Let's see if it works. Oh, it works. Yeah. So I mean, if you do this, right? So it's, I can you tell you, okay, so I'm actually storing this relation uh, in this file, right? So essentially there's no magic. We never have a relation. PostgreSQL will have a file associated with that. Okay. So, and then, so in this relation, we have two attributes A and B, right? But in database, it's actually going to store a kind of a special column, which is actually the, the record ID. So if you do the CTID thing, right, it's going to return essentially the tuple ID for this tuple. So as you can see, this tuple ID, right, CTID, is actually stored as a pair. So the first one, the zero is the page ID, right? So essentially you only have uh, three tuples, all of them are stored uh, on page ID equal to zero. And then this is the slot ID, okay? The first tuple is stored in the first slot. The second tuple is stored in the second slot. The third tuple is stored in the third slot, okay? So essentially it's going to do this slot pages type of thing. You can actually delete tuple, okay? Delete from A where A equals to 10, right? Let's delete the second tuple to see what happened. In this case, right? We are going to see after I delete the second tuple, I will only have two tuples. But because I'm doing slotted page, Right, so the first tuple will have tuple ID equals to one. No, sorry, like the like slot ID equals one. The second tuple is going to have slot ID equals to three. So essentially I'm going to have a hole in the page, right? So I will not change the tuple ID of the third tuple. So, which is very natural, right? But now you delete that, what this is going to do is going to set that slot, the second slot to empty. Right, without changing the data, which is which, uh, which makes sense. So one thing that is interesting is now, like when you doing this update again, and again, and again, you will end up having a whole bunch of pages with a whole bunch of empty slots, right? And then you can actually tell database like, okay, now I want you to reorganize my data to actually put all tables together to fill in the empty hole, so on and so forth. It's going to be very slow, right? But you can do that using uh, like vacuum full. Uh, so this is like where the database is going to reorganize all your data to really optimize your layout. And if you do this, and if you slide from the same relation, right, you can see now the second tuple is going to be put in the second slot to make sure all these two tuples are stored together to actually save space and also improve locality. So this, and this is just a very simple example about how essentially PostgreSQL organize your data, right? So as you can see, it's pretty much what we talk about. Every single relation corresponding to a file. And of course, I mean, you have a maximum size of the file. If the relation is too large, it will be a set of files, right? So, but uh, there's a correspondence between relation and the file. Uh, inside each file, Right, uh, you will have a whole bunch of pages, and every single record is associated with a record ID, which is a page ID together with a slot ID. If uh, and it's actually using slot page, and everything makes sense. Right, whenever you delete the things, uh, it's it's if you uh, unless you tell the database to reorganize your tuple, whenever you delete something, a database will actually not reorganize your tuple. It's just set the slot to empty. Okay. Yeah, so and um, this is just one way to organize data. So, but there are other ways depending on the type of operations that you want to do. So, for example, if you think about the previous design, right? We are assuming essentially all the attributes of a single row is going to be stored together. So, what could be the potential downside of this design, right? So, that actually gets us to two very different types of workload. One is kind of transactional called OLTP, and the second is more uh, analytical called OLAP. So here's just one example, right? So assuming I have uh, a database storing the information on Wikipedia, right? So I have the user account, I have the revision of the article, I have pages like uh, which correspond to one uh, wiki article. So in the OLTP type of workflow, right? So a single query just read and update kind of small amount of data that is related to a single entity in database because I care about a single entity, right? So often uh, whenever I'm writing a query, I'm on, I need the information of the whole row, okay? But another type of workload, right, is more analytical called OLAP. 
That is, I want to run a very complex aggregation query, right? Which will read a large portion of the database spanning multiple entities, right? For example, I want to uh, essentially group all the uh, essentially user account, right? So uh, by essentially when the user last log in and I want to calculate ah, how many users uh, log in previous months, how many users haven't been logged in for a year, something like that. If you compare this query and this query, the first query, which essentially update, like find a page, find a revision, uh, update, uh, like, like, uh, like, like do some lookup, right? So the first query only touch essentially a very few pieces of information in this whole relation, right? But whenever I, 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 I access information, I need the whole row, okay? But for the second one, I'm going to access a whole bunch of relation, uh, sorry, like a whole bunch of information in this database, right? And then I'm going to run a very complex, like essentially aggregation queries. So these are the essentially two different type of workload. And whenever you are thinking about the, like a page layout, right? So like a like half storage layout. So you might have different design choice uh, if you are optimizing for one of this workload over the other. So especially when you're talking about the OLED, right? Because the query is very complex it's often access different type of entities, right? So, and then if you are doing this query, right? So, and you can see in this relation, it doesn't need the whole row to answer this query, right? Always need is to uh, have access to the last login column and also the host name column. Right. Essentially, we are using like using our kind of row based storage that you put all one tuple always together. You are actually reading a whole bunch of information that's not useful for this type of query because I only need two columns. I don't. I don't. I don't need the first two columns. Right. But because of the locality, right. So uh, whenever you are reading a row, it's always here. Right. So and that could cause some problem if most of the query you are cares about are look like this. Right. So one thing that you can do is instead of storing all those information in the same row together, right, you could store all the information in the same column together, right? And that's give you a column store database, right? For example, you can have a page where uh, all the age number are stored together, all the names stored together, all the assets stored like like stored together, right? So that's an alternative page layout. So we are not going to go detail into this, but one thing I want you guys to know is there are multiple different ways that you can organize information into tuple and into pages. You could store them row-wise, you could store them column-wise, and you could store them in some hybrid way, right? You can store information as a, uh, as a chunk of rows and, and within each chunk, you store all the column together, for example. And you can do even crazier things, right? For example, like, a, like a, there's a data layout called the bit vision, right? You just uh, store all the bits together and you store the first bit of the first column together and then you store the second bit of the first column together, right? So that can actually give you some really friendly data layout for bit parallel algorithm, right? So the point is there are so many different ways you can organize data. The thing we are going to look at in this course is not the only way. Depending on what type of workload you want to run, what type of workload you want to support, different page layout might make sense, right? So that's going to decide what type of database you are going to use. Whether you use PostgreSQL, which is dominated by a row store layout, or whether you should use some like column store database, or for example, like, a, uh, like, a, like, which is more friendly to those analytical workload, or whether you should pick a database with a more hybrid layout, right? So which makes sense depends on your application. Okay, so just do not think PostgreSQL or those row-based storage is the only choice you have. I mean, it's not. And for different type of layout, there's always pros and cons, right? If you are thinking about like OLAP, right? So the advantage is if you really have a whole bunch of analytical query that only touches a subset of columns, that's going to save a whole bunch of I.O., right? And also it's easier for you to do data compression. Why? Because then all the information you store together have the same type, right? So some, sometimes it's kind of much easier for to comprise a single column other than comprise a single row, okay? 
So, so this one case is it's going to be slow for point query, right? For example, I really want to have all the attributes associated with a single row, right? So if you force a column store layout, that's going to be a little bit slow because you kind of need to assemble a tuple from different pages, right? So there's always a trade-off, right? So for different applications, you might need to pick uh, like the strategy that makes sense for you. So this is all we have for today, right? We talk about given a relation, how does database organize it as a file and how does file contain a set of pages and how does each page contain a set of tuples and uh, give you one example about the layout. So in the next lecture, we are going to go one layer up, okay? We are assume the Dix manager is there and we are going to talk about the buffer manager. Yeah, so that's all for today. Uh, if, you have, if you have any question, I'll be here. But <coughs> Sorry, I'll be here to answer them. Otherwise, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. Yeah. Are, um, are the tuples stored right after another in the file? Did I understand this correctly? Uh, can I say it again? Sorry, I, I can't the, understand. The tuples Sorry. themselves. Yeah. Are they stored right after another? So one tuple comes and then right afterwards you have the next tuple? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I mean, if you just uh, have an empty page and you keep inserting tuples, I believe in most of the database system that will be the case. But once mm -hmm. you update the page, for example, you delete the tuple, you, you insert another tuple, you might have those small holes in the in the tuple, like 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 like, like in the page, right? Mm -hmm. For example, yeah. like uh, like you you inserted like three tuples, T1, T2, T3, uh, all of them are eight byte. Right, and then you remove T two. You insert a smaller tuple with six bytes. Then you have two bytes of hole, right? In like a, like between T two and T three, right? Yeah. So and and there could be empty spaces in the middle. Uh, but if you run vacuum full, I would think database will try best to group everything together, right? Yeah. Okay. I see. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, hello. Hello. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, you mentioned on the last slide that we yeah. restore the um, um, the the entries together. What does it mean to store it, to store them together? I don't understand it. How that how does it look like in the background? Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. So uh, so like when we talk about row store, and that's clear, right? So so you think about page layout, right? So Whenever I store it, I will store this value and then this value, then this value, right? That makes sense for now yeah, for the for the for the tuple layout that we talk about. Essentially, this is a tuple, right? So, like for like like if you're doing this type of storage, like when you read the tuple, you are always mm -hmm. getting SSN name and age, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, in column store, whenever you are reading like a tuple, right, like one continuous region on hard drive, you are getting the age, this age, this age. You are actually putting all this information like together. Okay. It, it, like, yeah, so, so you're you actually storing the column wise, not row wise. Okay, then how can we, so then do we have a method to distinguish which is uh, from which? Oh yeah, yeah, so essentially then, then like you will actually change the layout from the beginning, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so like essentially in the header in the slot and, and okay. since there's no slot anymore right so essentially the like, like the whole page is going to change yep yeah I get it. and would you please go back to slide 29 yeah <coughs> there we, yeah go ahead oh, where is this again there where we're talking about uh, random assess and sequential assess um, I'm not uh, sure. Uh, uh, probably not 29, right? So. Uh, 18, sorry. Uh, 20, no, 20. it's not 19. 19 wait. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Where is it? Cool. Here, right? Oh, no, no, also not here. Uh, 23, sorry. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> as I saw here, the random assess D time is uh, always uh, D times uh, TS, TR, and TR. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. from what I understand, it's always 
takes longer than sequential SSD time. Is it correct? It always takes longer than sequential SSD times. It is always longer, uh, unless you are really lucky that all those random access happen to be on D pages stored together, <laughs> right? So, I mean, it, it, okay, it will not be faster than sequential access. And often the case, if you are not really, really lucky, it, it will be slower. Yeah. Okay. On hard drive, uh, on, like on hard drive, yeah. Mm -hmm. From what yeah. I read from the internet, it's random about random and sequential. Um, it says that uh, in a sequential access file, you yeah. can only read and write information sequentially, starting from the beginning of the file. So, uh, and with a random access, we can read and write anywhere in the file. Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. For, for sequential access, you don't need to start from the beginning of the file, right? Uh, I mean, you can say, yeah, let me start from the second page of the file and keep reading, right? And that's also fun, right? Yeah. But how can we do it? Because um, um, despite the fact that we have the pointers, to, yeah. to tell us where to get the, to assess the, the um, specific yeah. files, but we still have the linked list as the data structure all behind all this, right? We have to get through all uh, from the left to the right to get to the specific um, data we wanted. Oh yeah, that's, that's depending on how you implement it, right? So for example, if you are doing this page directory, you know where to go, right? Okay. Right, so they, like, they, like if you do link list, then I agree, maybe it's, it's kind of very, uh, you know, naive implementation is very hard for you to jump to a page, right? So like, that's why, uh, so I think uh, many of the system just use the page directory to do that, yeah. Okay, I get it. Yeah. All right, thank you very cool. much. Cool, cool. Have a nice day, thank you. You too, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, so we have one question about, can you recap the connection between multiple relations and their storage on different data pages? Okay, so that's a good question. I actually don't know how, how PostgreSQL deal with that. So, so, so my guess would be for each relation is going to create uh, a corresponding file, right? So, and then essentially, I mean, that is what I would assume PostgreSQL would do, right? So if you do SQLite, Right, so the whole database is actually in a single file. So I think uh, if you have multiple relations, I mean, it's, each relation is kind of occupy a region like subset of the pages in the database. And in the catalog, you will store uh, the set of pages corresponding to each of the relation. Does that answer your question? Yeah, cool. Okay, great. If there's no other question, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Yeah. <clears throat>